Right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you would have missed me for a little while, and it's because I traveled uh, to the United Kingdom, uh, to London more specifically, and to Cambridge to witness the graduation of my two daughters. It was a personal time. Um, I want to make that clear, you know, in this hypersensitive political environment in which we find ourselves, everybody finds some reason to criticize. I wanted to make it clear that I went uh, on my own time and on my own dime for personal family business uh, but I share with you that it was the graduation of my two daughters uh, one my older daughter graduated with a master's in law and the younger daughter with a bachelor's in law they've decided to follow in my footsteps insofar as law is concerned and to become lawyers by profession I want to say how very proud I am of them both uh, they have done remarkably well and uh, to leave a little island in a little space like Nevis and to go to the United Kingdom to rub shoulders with the best and the brightest in the world and to emerge uh, champions, emerge from that uh, as uh, individuals who are well-rounded uh, with educations from the top universities in the world. I am very, very happy and very pleased. I would want to publicly commend their mom, Sharon. She has done a phenomenal job with her children. And I would want to commend parents out there generally who are working hard to ensure that their children have a better life than they did. And sometimes I reflect on my own life and the path that I took and I reflect at how the generations must ensure that the next generation is better off, that the next generation does better. Neither my mother, Vicky of blessed memory, nor my dad, Irvin of blessed memory, had any formal education. Both because of circumstances were forced out of school at a very early age because of poverty and the harsh realities of life in Nevis in those days. And yet, they insisted that their children must get an education. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because they did not have an education, but they insisted that their children must get what they did not have. And imagine, if you will, the type of mindset that our people would have had over the years. Because that is not a unique story. The mindset that would have said that, listen, I must ensure that my children do better than I did. I must ensure that my children are better off than I did. And I must ensure they do their homework and I must ensure they go to school and they're there. And I attend the PTA meeting and I do all that is necessary to propel them forward so that they will have a better life than I did. And they will not have to struggle as much as I did. Because so many parents struggle to ensure that their children are better off and so I would want to thank my own mom and dad our people must make good decisions and must be responsible children come sometimes unplanned that happens that's life but we must understand that when children come that our lives must change we can't be the same because we now have brought into the world a child, a human being for whom we are ultimately responsible. And some people feel that the responsibility ends at 16. It doesn't. It's a lifetime responsibility. It's a lifetime. All when you're 50 and your daughter 30. Your daughter is coming over and your daughter wants assistance with something your daughter wants. You are the parent. You remain the parent for the rest of your lives. And sometimes I feel that people go into these situations not even thinking about the consequences not even considering the implications for their own lives that you can't go dance every night anymore because you now have a baby to deal with you can't do the latest hairstyle the nails and the weave because you have to focus on saying listen I need to deal with my baby first I need to deal with nursery and daycare I need to ensure that that little boy or girl goes to school and they have their lunch, they have their lunch bag, they have their lunch kit. And so certain things that I perhaps had grown accustomed to, going to the spa and going to the dance and going to the fete and going out with the boys on the weekend and ensuring that I drink up as much Guinness and Black Label as I can, I now need to pull back on some of those things. Why? Because I, and I say I because it's a personal choice and a personal responsibility. I have taken the decision to have a child or to invest in this way. And once you take that decision, 
your responsibility as a parent becomes that you must when the Lord calls you home be able to close your eyes and say I have left for my child my children a better place than I myself had when I came into this world that is what every parent in my view must try and do that is our job that is what we are required to do to ensure that we leave for our children a better world a better environment a better situation than we ourselves would have met so I was born in a little wooden house as you've heard me say from time to time on four stones in a place called Scarborough down Hanley's Road that is my circumstance a little outside latrine I would say toilet but that would make it sound sophisticated so let me use the old time word latrine a little old time kitchen with some galvanized an outside area where you had to go and bathe not with running water but with a bucket that was what I was born into I therefore have a responsibility to try to ensure that my children have something better than I did and there's nothing wrong with it some people try to criticize you and to denigrate you and to suggest that for you to be ambitious and to seek to make a better life for yourself and your family something is wrong with that there's absolutely nothing wrong with it you may be born into poverty you have no control over that but you can control what you seek to do with your life here we have and I've had a fantastic system of free education up until high school not only is it free it is mandatory by law that people are required to go to school until they're 16 so take advantage of these opportunities it was not always so so take advantage of these policies that are in place to ensure that your children have the basic building blocks for success and don't matter what people tell you a lot of people tell you oh no matter with school just learn to hustle hustle go and sell drugs go and hustle go and scam go and whatever because it's all about the money yes money is important but how you make the money is also important because how you make the money might sometimes determine if you can keep the money if you can invest that money and create more money a lot of people are there hustling but if you're hustling and you don't have no sense because you don't have any training your mind has not been trained you're not educated then the hustle is for naught because the same speed you hustle is the same speed you lose whatever you hustle so if you want to hustle here's my suggestion go to school hustle in terms of your grades and your academics if academics is not your thing or some people are not cut out for it find your niche it could be the arts you might be a great songwriter singer musician painter sculptor artist you might be a great mechanic plumber carpenter mason fisherman farmer find your niche but once you have found it put all that you have into it develop your art develop your skill and ensure that you're able to go out and create for yourself create for your family and ultimately ensure that your son or daughter is not using the same latrine and not having no electricity and not in the same little shack that you might have been born into it's called progress it's called ambition it's called putting yourself in a position to ensure that those who come after you are better and as I said, there's nothing wrong with it. Some people say, oh, I want to chastise you and say, oh, you play big shot, you forget where you're from. Oh, you this and you that. Don't worry with that. Poverty is a terrible affliction. And it's a situation where people find themselves in. It is not a place where anybody wants to stay there. But it's also not something that there is a quick fix for. Unless you go out and you get lucky and you win the lotto. You must work and build and develop. 
some of us want to make five hundred dollars a week and spend a thousand that's not the way to go because if that is the way that you decide you'll order your life then you will never get the building blocks necessary to move to the next level some of us decide school is not important for us acquiring a skill that's foolishness you rely on other things Oh, I have my good looks, I can rely on that. Oh, I'm a hustler, I can rely on that. I believe I could outsmart people, I could rely on that. At the end of the day, you're big on sand. Looks will fade. Believe it or not. Over time, looks will fail. So you can't rely on that. The hustle, don't believe you can outsmart people. Because too smart, they're the one smart do. So, the best building blocks are still what our parents taught us. Hard work integrity going out there and doing the best that you can showing people that you have the skill or the ac academic ability to do the job and doing the job to the best of your ability that's what needs to happen and I'm appealing to all of us because as I said I think that it is the solemn duty of parents to make life for their children better than they had it you must in life see that progression from the one generation to the next to the next and if after generations you're not seeing that progress then you have to ask why some say oh it's a system some say the government is to blame some say this some say that some say the other I spoke to somebody recently and they said to me that they don't intend to come back to Nevis and I asked why so there are no opportunities in Nevis. So I'm not coming to Nevis. And I said, well, that is interesting. Because every day I see people who are not from Nevis flocking into Nevis and trying to get opportunity here. So we must think that while the world is now a village and that we can go anywhere in the world, and I encourage our people to travel and to get their education and to fly, spread their wings, at the end of the day, it is also important for us to understand that there's nothing in life that is going to be necessarily handed to us on a platter that we have to prepare ourselves. Some people say luck. What is luck? They say luck is when opportunity meets preparation. You've prepared yourself so when the opportunity comes, you are prepared to grab it. People say, boy, he lucky. He get a big job there, boy, he lucky. He get that promotion, he lucky. He get a raise in pay, he lucky. But you have prepared yourself for when the opportunity comes. And I think that all of us need to do that. I perhaps I've gone on a bit of a tangent, but I think it's important. I want to say something tonight. I hope it is not controversial. But I believe that as the Premier of Nevis, and as the person who sits in the hot seat at this point in our history, the person who the buck stops with on the island of Nevis, that's, it is important not to only tell people what they want to hear, but to speak truth. To tell our people what the realities of life are. And I speak from a perspective of many of our people continuing this posture that they make decisions in their lives but having made their decisions in their lives the consequences of their decisions are not for them but are for somebody else and as a politician you get it every day because persons feel that it is your responsibility to solve their problems to some extent that is accurate because you elect people put them into office to create the environment in which you and others in the community can do well absolutely so I accept that but with that also comes some personal responsibility and our people don't like that conversation in fact I came on this very show some years ago and I had a conversation about people who have multiple children with no think nothing in place to sustain those children and somebody said to me that you should not be saying that because you are disrespecting people and it is the best way to lose an election if you tell people that they should be more responsible. And I said, no. 
if that is the way that we will lose elections here, then perhaps so be it. But we have to get a dose of reality. And we have to start to speak to our people in a way that our people understand. That if it is that your salary because of your qualifications is $500 a week for sake of argument, then what you need to do is to cut your suit to fit your cloth. We used to have those sayings and people used to say, what craziness Granny saying, but Granny was wise. Cut the suit to fit your cloth. Some people cut the suit in the head and then they come and they tell you, I want this amount of cloth because I'm making a big suit. That's not the way life works. And we need to start to have this real conversation with each other and with the society. I see some young people and they say to you at 19 or 20 or 21 that this is what they want. They want a car, they want a house. And you say, good. It's good to have that ambition. Now what is the plan to get there? There's no plan. They just want it. So you don't hear them say, well, I want to work and save and do the necessary, the building blocks. No. And then you hear the criticism that, oh, look, Tom, get this and Harry, get that. Warm well, to me. But Tom or Harry might be out there working two jobs, perhaps, saving up their money, not going to the bars often, not going to the salon as often, not doing some of the things as often, wear the same shoes more than once, wear the same outfit more than once. Because Tom, Harry, Susie, or Mary understands that, listen, I am putting a little something here aside because I have the ambition to buy a little piece of land, to buy a little vehicle, to advance myself in life. You know, I'm going to say something here again. When I was a boy in high school, we used to look at our colleagues and sink it's, you know, you have your friends in high school and things. And we used to say all the time, boy, our partners, them in sink it's, love a car, boy. They always want to buy a car. First thing for them is they want some wheels to run around in. And we, back then, clearly it's a long time ago, but back then, what was our ambition as Division Youth? And that's why we used to make the distinction. Because our ambition was always to own a piece of land. We always were looking to say we want a little piece of land. So we were not as concerned about car and motorcycle and all that. We were always thinking how we could get a little piece of land. And we had that culture of land ownership in Nevis. Many of us were lucky to inherit land from our grandparents and our parents. But we had a particular culture that informed what I consider to be the Nivision in us, that spirit that is uniquely Nivision. And I look around today and I see that the young people, many of them now, are not concerned about those things anymore. They get a little job, they start to make a little money, and their preoccupation is with other things. They're not putting a dollar aside to say, let me invest in a little piece of land. Let me ultimately try to get a home. They become preoccupied with acquiring other things. So what is the latest iPhone? iPhone 20 by now? I don't even know. What is the cost? You go here, you get it at the, 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 um, the telecoms provider here, Floor, Digicel or whatever. It might be as much as what? 4000 $4,000, $4,500. But you take that and you buy a little device. Because you want to say you're the first or you're hip, you have the iPhone 45, whatever it is. And you walk around. Now, I have an iPhone here, I don't know what it is. Because for me, once he could send messages and receive my emails, I'm good to go. But to take up $4,000, $4,500 to buy the latest gadget. When you don't yet own a piece of land, you don't yet have any assets that you've acquired. To take up 
the two thousand US dollars or three thousand US or whatever the cost might be to buy a Louis Vuitton handbag or Gucci or Prada because oh that is what I see people are wearing. I am just saying to you that if you can, absolutely. Absolutely. If it lies within your means and your capacity to do these things, then God bless you. But when you have to make a choice as to whether these are the things that you use your resources for, or you use your resources instead to invest in things that will build you and ultimately help build your family, then I think that is where the conversation needs to occur. We have these big events that happen that we know about. Music Fest, White Sands, Tropics, huge events, five in one fit. Very important. Beautiful events put on by those who are in the emerging entertainment sector here. And a lot of our people, again, they need new nails, toes and fingers, they need new hair, they need new lashes, they need new outfit, they need makeup. You're going to go and spend a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars to put on makeup to go wet fit. It's an interesting concept. Because when you get wet with the hose, what happened to the makeup? And this is not in any way, shape or form an attack. It is rather saying that these are the discussions that we must have with each other. Because sometimes when you look at an event that you attend, not just the cost of the ticket and the VIP or whatever it may be, ticket, but the cost of all that you have to put into it. Do you realize that sometimes for a single fit, some people would spend over a thousand dollars? Single fit. Some people would spend that amount of money and they get into a fit and they're still buying drinks or whatever the case may be. And if it's two or three people, well, you multiply that. And then you start to reflect that there are other obligations that you have. And are those ob other obligations being taken care of? When you're going to spend a thousand dollars to go to the fit because you had the outfit and all that goes with it, are your children's school fees paid for? For the term? Are you certain about food in the house? Are you certain about gas in the vehicle? Are you certain about the rent or the mortgage? And as I said, nobody wants to hear these things because people's attitude nowadays seem to be, man, let people have their fun and do what they want to do. And I am encouraging our people to be responsible. That is all it is. Every one of us likes nice things and every one of us want to go out and let down our hair and eat at a nice restaurant. And absolutely, if you can do it every night, God bless you. But if you can't do it every night, no matter with Mr. Jones, the neighbor, who you see doing it every night, you don't know how Mr. Jones get where he got. If you can't do it every night, then you say, listen, I'm going to do it once a month. If you can't do it once a month, you say, listen, I'm going to do it every quarter. If you can't do it every quarter, you say, listen, I'm going to do it on my birthday. But adjust while, of course, in your mind, you're working towards that goal that you have. When I'm 30, I'm going to own a house. And me no concern about fit and iPhone and whatever, because I am working towards that goal of owning my own house by the time I'm 30. And to do that, I need to put some money in the bank. I need to have something. So when I go to the bank, and the bank started to tell me about 20% down payment and all of that, I could say, bank, I've been saving for the last 10 years, 12 years to get that done. By the time I'm 30, I want to have my degree. And so I'm working towards that. 
putting aside something to make sure that I can go off to UE or UVI or wherever and come back with my degree. And why do you invest time in going to get a degree? Because you're building. You're building. And I will share a personal story with you. I was a beneficiary of scholarships. That is how I got an education. And when I went to UE on a scholarship from the Nevis government, and thereafter to the Norman Manley Law School, I graduated first in class at Norman Manley. Remember, it was a big thing back then. And when I graduated, offers came because everybody wanted to come and headhunt, as they call it, the best. And so the offers came. I was offered jobs in the BVI. I was offered jobs elsewhere. And while I was at Norman Manley Law School, I remember there was a little notice on the bulletin board about the Winter Williams Commonwealth Scholarship. One scholarship was being offered to the entire Commonwealth. When you reflect at the size of the Commonwealth, 53, 54 nations, you have places like India, and over a billion people is a member of the Commonwealth, Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, Nigeria, and those populous countries, Ghana, Kenya. And you reflect on the number of people. You say one scholarship, all of them people are going to apply for. And my friends laughed and said, boy, what foolish is you doing? It's harder to get that than to find a needle in a haystack. And I said, well, nothing venture, nothing gained. Because if you don't try, the answer is no. You have answered your own question by not trying. You have told yourself, no, you can't do it or you can't get it. And so I applied. University of Oxford. And I applied and promptly forgot about it. Some weeks, some months went by and then I got a letter in the mail. There, Mr. Brantley, you have won the Winter Williams Scholarship to come and do postgraduate work at one of the finest and most storied universities anywhere in the world, the University of Oxford. And I looked at the letter and I was shocked. When I went to my friends who had laughed at me, they continued to laugh at me because they decided I must have been the only person in the world that applied. And that might have been the case. I don't know. But the bottom line is that I had that opportunity. Now, I will confess that I did not know anything about Oxford. I did not know anything about what is top university. I was at UWE. I was a proud UWE graduate. I had a law degree under my belt. I now had my legal education certificate. I could come out and practice. And I came from a long history of poverty. And I remember when I came back, I spoke to my father. Two people I spoke to. One was my father, Irvin Brantley of Blessed Memory. One was Sir Simeon Daniel, who was like a father to me, also of Blessed Memory. Now, Sir Simeon, of course, our national hero, he had the opportunity to get an education and a profession. He was a lawyer by profession, had become Premier of Nevis, and now a national hero. My father had not had that opportunity because I said through circumstances he was forced out of school while still a boy. But the advice that I got separately from them both was instructive because both of them told me the same thing. Take the scholarship and go to Oxford. And I said, well, I, what, what, what Oxford are you telling me about? I want to go and make some money. I'm tired of asking my father for a little change, my mother for a little change. I need to go and earn. And both of them said to me, listen, take the scholarship and go to Oxford. I remember the words of Sir Simeon like they were yesterday. He said to me that with that Oxford qualification, you're going to make more than you would have made without it. I will go further. I was offered a job in the British Virgin Islands by then a firm they're called Harney, Westwood and Regals. I now think they're called Harneys. They're now an international firm. At the time they were much smaller, I think seven or eight members. And I will always give credit to then a managing partner, I think his name was Richard Peters, because he offered me the job to be a lawyer in the BVI at Harney, Westwood and Regals, as they were then called. And when I told him that I had got this scholarship to go to Oxford, he said to me, go to Oxford, young man. We'll hold the job for you. 
but you go on to Oxford because that is important. Now I say that because sometimes those around you have to have a vision that you yourself may not have. And as young people sometimes we feel like we know it all, well I got my degree no one. I'm ready to for the world. But here are people who are older and wiser giving me some advice that for me turned out to be life-changing because I went on to Oxford, I got my BCL and thereafter the world opened because that Oxford degree just as Sir Simeon promised opened doors that would not otherwise have been opened. When I came back here as a lawyer I will tell you that many people called Daniel Brantley where I was at the time and the only reason for them calling is that they saw that I had gone to Oxford. And for them that meant something. It was a mark of excellence. And I never understood what I had in my hand. Because I was actually contemplating not going. Because I said, man, I want to come and hustle and make a dollar. And the advice that all three of these distinguished gentlemen gave me. My father, Sir Simeon. And Richard Peters was take your time defer that desire to go and make money and earn while you equip yourself even better to do that and I have in my lifetime realized that they were right and so some people may say tonight Mark Brandt, your trooping is you're coming telling people. You're being controversial. You're telling people what to do with their money. You're telling them don't do this and don't do that. If people want to go dance, let them go dance. If they want to drink off the money, that's their business. And all of that is absolutely correct. What you do is your business. But if you want to ensure that your children have more than you had, if you want to ensure that you leave something for them that they can build on, so that they can then leave something for their children and that that can continue because that is how you build societies and communities then these are necessary discussions that we should have there are some who have entered politics and all that they do is spend their time telling you how much poverty there is and how much is wrong and how much is bad and that somehow elect them and they will solve all that and it's a beautiful pitch that's perhaps what one is expected to say but absent from that discussion what is your role in building your life in ensuring that you take decisions in taking responsibility for your decisions and ensuring that you yourself are taking the decision and putting yourself in the position making the right investments in time in energy in money whatever it may be to build something tangible for yourself anybody whose recipe is to simply give you a fish every day is not really interested in your well-being or your development because the minute you don't get that fish you have to go look for them and beg them for the fish the person who is rather interested in speaking to you as I am seeking to do and to say to you that it is better for you to learn how to fish and to teach your children how to fish so that instead of somebody giving you a fish every day and you being dependent on that person for that fish every day. You learn how to fish and your children learn how to fish. The whole household now is fishing. And build them together. That I think is a far more important narrative and a far more important conversation that needs to be had. I'll say one last thing on that as I talk about building. And the value of pooling resources now again nearest people don't like to hear that they tell you partnership is leaky ship we hear that all the time and I was looking at something recently and there was a young man from Africa a black man and he was commenting that 
there are Indian families that are arriving in Australia and he was in a particular very high-end luxurious housing development with pools and beautiful and he said that nearly all of those were owned by Indian families and he engaged in a discussion as to why because listen we can all learn from each other you know there is value in observing cultures observing people and learning from each other and so he asks the question why how it is that persons who could come from India to Australia after so many years are owning these beautiful homes in this beautiful development and he compared it to persons who are coming from Africa to Australia and did not appear to be doing likewise and he came to a conclusion which I think has some merit he said the difference was the level of pooling of resources and resources means money yes but it also means skill and opportunity pooling that that he observed in the Indian community that was absent in other communities sometimes my brothers and sisters partnership is the way to go sometimes you can't come up to the deposit that is required on your own but in partnership you could do it and it gives you the necessary start now I know people don't like to hear that people don't like to hear that but I speak to people all the time you have people who I consider to be in committed relationships why I say that because they have two three children together they've been together for 20 years and yet in buying a home they will tell you no me no want she name on me land or me no want she name on me house or no me no want he name on me land me no want he name on me house you may not be married but because you haven't been to church or before the magistrate you are living like married people you live together you have children together well you're married for all intents and purposes in fact the law refers to that as a common law marriage but you look and say listen with a, just a, an adjustment in mindset and instead of saying me no one, me no, you say look let us pool the resources and instead of paying fifteen hundred dollars every month for 10 15 20 years in rent let us get a little something of our own and pool our resources and make that little something work we may pay 1800 a month instead but we know it belongs to us one of you may not be able to do it on your own because the bank say well your salary is small or whatever but two of you or three of you or four of you and that was the point that the gentleman was making he said that the Indian community pooled together so sometimes they bought one house two three families might be living in that one house but it allowed them to get equity it allowed them to develop and then slowly by slowly and he said that is how the community now grows and develops and that's how you build wealth and I thought it was an interesting analysis and one that we should think about we have family members living together paying rent and you say to them well what if you want to pool your incomes and get a mortgage and build a home a family home no me no want no confusion because my sister gonna think this and my brother gonna think that you gonna think that this belong to them and but you're living together now and you're paying a mortgage you're paying a rent and my father again of blessed memory he always used to tell me rent is dead money again some may not like to hear that but that's what he used to say rent is dead money if you pay rent all your life at the end of the day you help the landlord pay for his place but you don't own anything at the end of the day so pooling resources and resources it means money but it also means opportunity it means that when I hear some people say well 
I see somebody from Dominican Republic walking at this place. And before I look, I see three, four of them walking in the place. How how that happen? You know what happened? Because one is working there, and that one here, that a vacancy is available. They tell the cousin or they tell a friend. You know? They say to their friend or their cousin, you know, me amigo, something is here. Come and apply. Mi hermana, mi hermano, come and apply. Our people instead of a tendency, no, me want them, they come in here because them, they gone this and them, they gone that. And so rather than a position of us pooling our knowledge, our resources, our opportunities, instead, we try to say no. Keep out them there. Keep those out. Other people are saying to the contrary, no, bring them in. So, my little soliloquy tonight was really designed to encourage us to understand that this thing called life, and I believe at my age now, I'm 53 years old, I think I'm qualified to talk about life. That this thing called life has certain fundamentals to it. Yes, there'll be the person who win the lotto. Yes, there'll be the person who a bag of money drop out the sky and drop in the lap. But that is not the norm. The norm is really people who position themselves and who progress through life. You should be able to see every five years, every decade, every decade, that progression. And you only do that when you make decisions. You understand that decisions and choices have consequences. You seek to prepare yourself and deal with those consequences. And you understand that ultimately, nobody is responsible for you but you. You are responsible for you. And when you decide to bring children into this world, you are responsible for them. It is not about when you sit down and you clink two Guinness with the guys and you say, boy, a 12 picnic me got, you know. A 15 picnic me got, you know. No. That is not the point, you know. Because if you have 15 picnic, the question is how many of them you feed? How many of them you're taking care of? How many of them you have put something aside to send to school and to send to college to make sure they become doctor, lawyer, engineer, medicine, carpenter, whatever they want to be? Not just both sent to say, it's 15 picnic you have, as if you have achieved the gold medal. No. It is, are you in a position to do for them? so that you can ensure that they have a better life than you did. That, my friends, is where the rubber meets the road. I want to take a moment, it is 10 to the hour of 9 o'clock, to wish Prime Minister Drew and his delegation, who are now in New York at the United Nations General Assembly, all the very best. He has led a large delegation there, larger than usual, but I would assume they have their reasons for that size of delegation. I'm hopeful that they get the work done because the UN, as you know, is a time of year when leaders come from all across the globe. It is an in-person UN General Assembly. Um, we know over the last two years due to COVID that they had uh, gone to uh, Zoom, I think it was. They were doing um, virtual. I think this the I want to think it was the 75th uh, UN General Assembly was, was virtual um, and they are now going back to in person. So we have the, the government, um, federal government is representing St. Kitts and Nevis in New York. I'm to wish them well. I'm told that Dr. Drew will address the UN sometime on Friday and this would be his maiden address. I wish him well. Um, I was privileged to have had the opportunity to address the UN General Assembly in 2017. Um, becoming the second division to do so because I think the Honorable Patrice Nisbet as Foreign Minister would also have addressed the UN General Assembly. And so it is my hope that things go well. It is an important time of year and I am hopeful that they get the work done and that the excellent position that St. Kitts and Nevis has found itself in in terms of its diplomacy, that that will continue. Let me also take a moment because I'm aware that we have uh, some people who are hospitalized here to extend my thoughts and my prayers to them. 
and even for those who are not hospitalized but who might be at home and not feeling well who are sick or under the weather I extend my thoughts and prayers to them and to let them know that we are all praying for their speedy recovery and so we hope that God will touch them and heal them he is of course the great healer and in him all things are possible and so I would want to uh, say that and to indicate that we wish them a very speedy recovery. It is now six minutes to the hour of nine o'clock based on the time here. And we will therefore open the lines and ask for your calls at 869-469-1616 and 869-469-1700. Let me go straight to the phones. Good evening, you're on the mark. Okay, that caller isn't there. Callers, please be patient with us but those are the numbers to call. So if you want to be a contributor to the show this evening, then please call those numbers. Let me try again. Good evening, you're on the mark. Good evening, Michelle. Good evening, my dear. How are you? Well, I'm giving God a big thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sympathy is going out to Miss Claxton at Ramsway Pasha on the passing of, uh, passing of Miss Claxton from the kids. Mm -hmm. And sympathy is going out to Mrs. Wilkes on the children of the... What are they? Whatever the children name at um Ramsbury Pasha. Romans eight, twenty seven and twenty eight. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to hear them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Good night to my friends and family over there in Canada. Mark, you have a wonderful night. Okay, thank you so much. And my, I, I join you in extending condolences and all those, to all those who have lost loved ones. It's always a difficult time. And I could always count on you to call in with a beautiful scripture and also, of course, with your thoughts for others. So thank you as well for your contribution. You have been a staple of this show over the last 15 years and for that we are truly grateful let's go back to the telephones good evening you're on the mark hello Patrona, weekend. yes good evening to you how a blessed night is when brother we're going all right how are you we give giving thanks man love, love and honor to you female um just a vibration here while i good night to your listener very well and internet listening on the mark uh, this is what i'm speaking to the eye and I would just like to bring something to your attention. I see in bands up here where I was punching his children to this children where he just returned back to sink it. And I realized in the bands up area where they have a, a structure called Hamilton Bank Reserve Plaza. What is the purpose of that bank in that area, may I ask, the Premier? You mean what is the purpose? It's a bank. I, I mean, what's the purpose of any bank? Well, what it's kind a of business, it's a business that has been established. To safety are the ground of the people of Bangkok and in the people of Nevis as a whole. That is why I'm asking you as a premier but, to the people of Nevis. But I'm not understanding the question. Um, but you know, you don't try to be a technical, but you don't understand. No, 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 no don't tell me you don't try to be technical. You, if you, call, 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 a conversation involves you listening me talking, me listening you talking, okay? Yeah, Both of us can be talking. If you went to Basket and you saw that there's a bank established there with premises, how is it the question about securing land arises? I mean, you must therefore be able to tell me, was it government land? Was it the people's land? Or did the people buy private land to set up their business? What's it, what's it, what's it, what, that's I'm trying to understand what question you're asking me. That's why you're asking what support are you giving to the people of Nevis? What support am I giving to the people of Nevis? Not you, the bank, what is in Bangor, locating banks, but I ask him, what is the bank support meant to the people of Bangor and Nevis people? What do we do? Well, well, it, is, it is, as you say, the bank reserve. So uh, if people from the people of Nevis, can they go there and do transaction and other things in that aspect of it? Well, as I understand it, it's an international bank, and uh, international banks do not deal with local clients, they deal with international clients. But what they would do is, of course, provide jobs, provide, you know, opportunities for careers and that sort of thing. That is why people come and invest. And that is why a government would 
get investors because you want jobs provided in the country you want activity in the country so that is as far as I know what they do like any other business they come in they invest their money like local business or international business and they seek to invest in order to make money that is what investors do but along the way we try to get them to employ individuals no different to the Four Seasons or the Park Hyatt or any other investor or investment that comes so is the international bank based in from which country or territory is can I ask you now? An international bank simply means that it is licensed to do business with persons outside of the country. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that they're coming from any particular territory. It simply means that the license that they have will not allow you or I to go there and open an account. To do that, we must go to a domestic bank. We must go to, to Republic Bank or to national bank or to bank and nevis to do that an international when, bank where is it that that bank is located outside of the, the capital of nevis and the other banks them are in the capital of nevis but that is not they true that is not true caller we have a bank in cotton ground we we have, in cotton ground? yes we have this one in barnsgut we have one that is uh, up here the bank in cotton ground i mean i have to mock bank in the bank but i will whatever it asks for the bank in cotton ground and you say it's not true so i asked you a question the bank in cotton ground is the bank of nevis international bank of nevis international there's one up here in stony grove called the international merchant bank but you got a lot of corruption bank around you man you know easy call up call up please again we, 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 you know we, why are they corruption we, bank caller violate, me not violate, you know, me no boy say why are they we corruption are, bank are you say so banks are hiding what they've done to our people and you need to put your foot down and regulate these banking institutions to know to give a job institution to the people of Nevis so the people of Nevis know how to do with banking to your and we can't check money or international standards you all need to work up because you say caller 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 you call the show right Yes, well, you call the show yes, for us to try to enlighten each other and the public or you just call the show to talk what you don't know? Well, I don't know. I know that you, you have a lot of cocaine dealers over in Nevis. Alright, caller, I think, I think that that is... Caller, please cut out this caller. I don't normally do it, but caller, we don't have no time for nonsense. You understand? This is a show that we seek to debate ideas. If you don't know and you call and you genuinely want to know, then let's have a conversation. We help each other, we enlighten each other, and we hopefully, through the conversation, enlighten the public. If you're just going to start the call, the call people corrupt and now start talking about cocaine deal and all kind of thing. Well, if you're no cocaine dealer, call the police. Don't call me. Call the Charleston Police Station. Call the Commissioner of Police. Them are who deal with cocaine dealer. I like to encourage our people to lift the standard. Now you went up to Barnsgut, you say. You see a bank up in Barnsgut. You don't know anything about it. But you start to talk about who corrupt and who not corrupt. You start to talk about who get land and how to protect the land. Do you know whose land it was? As far as I know, they bought land from a private landowner. The government did not sell any land to anybody. The government did not provide any of the people's land to anybody. So if you have a piece of land that you own and you decide that you want to sell your piece of land because you, for whatever reason, you want to invest in your children's education you want to move to another area buy something someplace else the government should tell you you cannot sell your piece of land is that what you're saying you need to sell your land because you need medical attention that you can't sell your land that's your land and so if you decide to sell your land an investor buys your land and creates a business what is wrong with that so you go and you see a compound. You don't know what keep, but you start to talk. And that's what I keep telling our people before we engage our mouths. Seek to engage our brains. Think. And if you don't know, ask. Nothing is wrong with that. If it is I'm confused about a situation, I don't understand a situation, the only way to clear up that confusion is to ask. And I don't say this with any disrespect to you. But don't call this show with wild speculation and wild statements that you have absolutely no basis of talking about. Now you're talking about people in Nevis, cocaine dealers in Nevis. Well, if you know cocaine dealers in Nevis, well, you call me chauffeur, call the police. That's your duty as a citizen. Call the police. 
I'm sure they would welcome your call. All right? But they say in the forum for that. And I, I try to keep this short a certain level. And I keep saying to individuals, if you're not prepared to have a discussion at that level, then this is not the show for you. It's as simple as that. I don't say it to be insulting of anyone. But I say it because we have to recognize that we are trying to do something here of value to the community. And if our conversation is not enlightening each other, then it's not a worthy conversation for on the ear. Later when we sit down and we drink in Guinness and we chat in foolishness, we chat that. But right now we are on the mark, and on the mark is listened to across the globe. So let us maintain that standard. And we are on Von Radio. We are caller. Only the best will do. And so it means when we say that, that when you call, bring your best. On about to come. Let's go back to the phones and say good evening, you're on the mark. Hello? I want to greet you again, brother. Premier. Yes. And not disrespect right now. Let me tell this here, please. Please. Can you listen to me, please? I am listening to you. Okay, then. Enough love and respect. Please. Yes. Now, you thinking that I turn to chastise is something against people. Well, let me say this here. Me not come to chastise a thing against nobody. I'm not saying, Navy and Sink is two island with one federation mark. And if we can come as a people together, what is it that we can educate the people them properly? You tell me you're going to put something in that area, and you tell me now, oh, it, 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 it was land bought by a private owner. Let me say this, your budget. Navy is in only one land, and you know that too. Navy is what? Navy is people in only one land. You know that? They don't own their own land? They do their own their own land. Well, who own the land? If Nevis Am I talking about, okay, do the government have ownership in the land then, in Nevis? The government owns some lands. Do they have ownership in the land in Nevis? That's the matter. May I ask you? I said the government owns some lands. The government doesn't own every some. piece of land in Nevis. They own some. It is a shame to see you, you have an island and government that owns some land. The government is supposed to have more initiative in owning majority of the land in a, in a Nevis. In the next thing, that's what we say, you know, under the former administration and even under the one with Denzel Douglas and Simmons and Bratchett, a corruption them that were when the people them too. You don't tell me you are going to have land that's supposed to be in our people's eyes of development and people coming from outside and come to about their, their investors or their investors a bit. They don't come with no money, they come borrow money from the same the, the, the um, domestic bank them where you just tell me to we have, we have to go to. And these domestic banks don't want to even implant in lending the loan local people who the money is circulating around to. But anyway, who know it, who know it is it. And me I say, it's time now we people understand economics around here and stop like dummy boy. You go say you study you know, A B A B B A and then you come back you stick and got job down here. You know think it's a nevis. So when you, when you went out you go study for them. And I'm glad you know me a revolutionary brother. I respect you as a brother. I call you my brother. I call you. You know me and you We still love you. I still respect you. I call I love and respect you too. But you people them the proper way. But and stop telling lies. Yeah, but they're not good brother. All right. Okay, call. Have a safe night with me. All right. Thank you very much. And I love and respect you as well. And that is why I made the point. And I was at pains to say that I don't want you to think I'm disrespecting you. But being a revolutionary by proclaiming yourself a revolutionary when. The, the, the basic building blocks for the ideas that you're espousing don't exist is really not being revolutionary at all. You asked me, does the government in Nevis own land? I said, yes, the government owns some land. The government doesn't own all the land. Name me one country in the world where any government owns all the land. Or even a majority of the land for that matter. Land ownership is guaranteed to individuals in the constitution of St. Kitts and Nevis. That is why, my brother, you could have a house and land. Your mother, your father, your, 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 your three children could have their own house and land that they could buy and sell and build and mortgage and borrow and do all of this thing. It is because we're guaranteed the right to own land. Well, if the government is owning all the land, how are you going to own a piece? Going back to my early soliloquy, as I call it. How you want to get something to pass on to your children to make sure that they are better off than you were? That they have an easier life than you did? So it's not just about proclaiming yourself a revolutionary. You must think about the things that you are espousing. 
because where the government owns everything you know what that means that you become dependent on the government you become the type of government run government control country state no room for individuality and so rather than what you are espousing as being revolutionary i believe that you're taking our people back what people need is to, the, the, the individual needs to be empowered that he or she can own something and empower him or herself. So that is the reality, you know, you say about investors not having money and all that. And you're right, some of them call themselves investors, but they don't have a thing. They just come and they say they come from overseas, so they're investor. And that is why I've always said that we must also look out for our local people who are also investing. But that is not to say that others are not genuinely investors. The people at Four Seasons were genuine investors. Those at Montpellier and Golden Rock, those at Park Hyatt and Singies and Marriott, they've come to invest. They've created jobs. They've created economic activity. They've created opportunities in the country. So we have to also embrace those investors who do come with some resources to invest. So caller, I, I welcome the call. I trust again that there's no hard feeling, but understand it on this show if you come with ideas that are not well developed they're going to be challenged and i expect you to challenge mine as well that is how we grow but again i go back that our exchange must bring value to each of us and to those who are listening let's go back to the phones ladies and gentlemen the numbers again to call are 469-1616 and 469-1700 this is on the mark straight talk across the narrows i'm your host mark brantley for those who are just tuning in you're listening to the eastern caribbean's only powerhouse von radio the voice of nevis and i'm happy to be home and happy to be back on the mark with you now quite a, a lot is happening while i wait for the phones to ring let me talk about some of the developments um, I am unsure whether I can have a press conference this month because of the difficulties in terms of how the month has run um, and the fact that I had some personal travel. And so I will uh, have to use this program to give some updates in terms of some of the matters that I would ordinarily speak to at a press conference. I would like to first of all point out that our geothermal energy exploration effort that has been ongoing since 2004 so it's been an 18 year odyssey that we are now seeing some light at the end of the tunnel i would want to thank the leadership at nevlik the chairman mr stedman tross but also mr albert gordon the general manager and his team for leading this effort and uh, so far we have engaged quite fruitfully with the caribbean development bank if all goes as planned, the CDB is suggesting to us that we might be able to select the driller for the production wells as early as December and thereafter to mobilize resources so that into next year, early next year, we can have the long-awaited production well drilling done. I said production well because we would have had already the exploration wells. Production well is a much uh, more expensive and larger bore a larger hole that is being dug and so we look forward very much to that i would want to thank the cdb particularly mr joseph williams who has really worked assiduously on this and who has worked hard to get us over the edge i also want to thank prime minister drew and why do you say i say that is because in my first meeting with prime minister drew i raised this issue with him i told him that the cdb required a letter from his office indicating that they had no objection to this project proceeding because whilst the NIA has the capacity to speak with um, the CDB at the end of the day they wanted to know that the federal government was not objecting in any way and the Prime Minister has provided that letter that we were waiting on for a very long time I want to point that out I don't want to get political tonight but we're waiting on that letter for a very long time Prime Minister Jew has provided that letter and I want to thank him publicly because it has now made it possible for the CDB to continue its engagement and to activate the plans for us to move this project forward. There's no commitment from the federal government financially or from us. The CDB is who we're dealing with at this point, but I'm simply saying that without that, the CDB was at a, at a standstill waiting for that green light. They have the green light now and we're proceeding apace, and so I'm very grateful for that. Do we have somebody who's holding? Okay, um, so I also wanted to touch on this case that there has been a lot of discussion about. 
It's a case involving a company called Ocean Reef and the Nevis Island Administration. Now, let me give a little background. The Nevis Island Administration took a decision to acquire some lands at Herbert Speech. I go on record to commend the Honorable, er the Honorable Alexis Jeffers, our Minister of Lands, the area representative for St. James, because I well remember when he made the case that Herbert's Beach must stay in the hands of the people of Nevis. And the lands were to be sold, and the government stepped in and acquired the lands in order to preserve that area for the people of St. James and for the people of Nevis. I say all the time, every single person from St. James, if you go to Herbert's Beach, when you go there, remember Alexis Jeffers, because he's the man who fought we still have to go and find the resources to pay for the lands, but the lands have been compulsorily acquired. No. As a consequence of that effort, there was some kind of developmental agreement of some kind with this ocean reef. They were saying they were going to build some hotel because they own some lands in the area over there as well. And they sued the NIA, claiming some breach of some developmental agreement. Now, they would have served their lawsuit on a secretary at the legal department here in Nevis. The NIA had sought to retain counsel in Mr. Terry Byron, Terence Byron. But there was some miscommunication. I think there was some issue of the retainer arrangements not being made on time, whatever the issue was. The necessary acknowledgement of service was not filed in the time prescribed by the rules. And so Ocean Reef went ahead and entered a default judgment. What a default judgment means, brothers and sisters, is that there has been no adjudication. Default means that the other side didn't do something in time. And so the NIA did not file an acknowledgement of service in time because of that miscommunication between when it was served and our lawyer on the matter who was Mr. Terence Byron. And so Ocean Reef rushed in and got a default judgment for some 79 million US dollars. Mr. Byron, learned counsel, appealed that and said to the master that that default judgment should be set aside for multiple reasons. The master apparently disagreed. And so an appeal was filed to the Court of Appeal from that decision. So the only issue before the Court of Appeal was whether this default judgment should be allowed to stand or it should be set aside, service acknowledged, defense filed, and the parties go to a trial. I am advised, and by reading the file myself, that the learned Chief Justice raised of her own volition this issue of whether the Nevis Island Administration had legal standing to sue or be sued in civil proceedings. Now I want to make it clear that that was not an issue before the court. That issue was not argued by anyone. The court raised that issue of its own volition and invited counsel to pay some attention to that issue and to provide some guidance to the court. A legal opinion was produced by the Attorney General's office in St. Kitts. The Solicitor General in St. Kitts, Mrs. Simon Bullen, she was engaged. Mr. Terence Byron was engaged. And Mr. Henry Brown, Queen's Counsel, Senior Counsel, was also engaged. All of them were the lawyers and luminaries involved in this matter. All the lawyers, Attorney General, Solicitor General, Henry Brown, Terry Byron, all in their submissions concluded that the Nevis Island Administration had the capacity to sue and be sued. In fact, it had always been so. For 39 years of independence, the NIA has always had the ability to sue and be sued. The NIA has sued, and the NIA has been sued. And the court has never had an issue with that. In fact, there's a decision in a case called Choice FM against the NIA, 
when the court specifically held that the NIA had that authority. There was a matter that I had argued when I was young and a lawyer. And I remember well the decision was that of Olome Edwards, Justice of the High Court, who made the same conclusion. So there was never an issue about the capacity of the NIA to sue or be sued. The Court of Appeal, for whatever reason, and of its own volition, raised the issue and invited counsel to speak to that issue. Counsel, all of them, were unanimous in their view that the NIA does in fact have the capacity to sue and be sued and that in fact it had always been so. So it was most interesting then that the Chief Justice took a contrary view and basically would have disagreed with all of the submissions from all of the lawyers in front of the court and addressed a question that was not germane to the issue before the court of whether the default judgment should be set aside and concluded that the NIA does not have any legal authority to sue or be sued in civil proceedings but that any civil proceedings must be brought by and against the Attorney General. Now we understand the Attorney General is a construct of the Constitution and a figure in the national government. There's no Attorney General in Nevis. And so you now have the juxtaposition, if you will, of a Nevis Island administration created by the Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. And what it means by saying it's the supreme law of the land is that any law which is inconsistent with the Constitution is void. It cannot stand. Any provision of any law that is inconsistent with the Constitution is void. It cannot stand because the Constitution is a yardstick by which you measure all other laws. The Court of Appeal came to a conclusion that the Crown Proceedings Act, which is subservient, which is inferior to the Constitution, applied. And therefore, the NIA could only sue or be sued through the mechanisms provided in the Crown Proceedings Act, which means that it was through the Attorney General. Now, I want you to consider with me for a moment that the NIA, by the Constitution that creates it, the supreme law of the land that creates it, has been given exclusive authority on the island of Nevis for a number of areas. A Nevis Island Assembly has been created, given exclusive lawmaking authority for a number of areas. The Nevis Island Administration has been created, giving exclusive responsibility on the island of Nevis for a number of areas. So, water, roads, health, the economy, lands, all of these, the Constitution gives the NIA, industry, gives the NIA exclusive, what does the word exclusive mean? It means excluding all others. It means it is your right and your right alone. So the supreme law of the land gives the NIA, the Nevis Island Administration, all of this exclusive responsibility. It's the NIA in relation to land in Nevis. You're in charge. In relation to roads in Nevis, you're in charge. A number of other matters. Education, matters such as um, electricity, economic development, industry. You want to set up uh, a film industry? NIA, you're in charge. But the consequence of this decision is to say to the NIA, yes, you're in charge, but you can't sue or be sued, and therefore, by necessary extension, you really can't enter into any contract in relation to any of these matters. Because if the NIA wants to fix the island main road tomorrow and wants to give a contract to a company to fix the island main road, the judge is basically saying, yes, the Constitution gives you exclusive responsibility for roads in Nevis, but you can't enter into that contract because if the person doesn't perform, you can't sue them. And if you don't pay, they can't sue you. And it means that the NIA now has the responsibility of going cap in hand to the Attorney General to beg the Attorney General, Lord, I beg you, please, could you bring this case here for me? Because this company in Nevis owe money 
and they not pay and whatever am I supposed to do could you please bring the case and the attorney general can say no I'm not interested in that matter equally the attorney general and the federal government who have no responsibility because the constitution says that the NIA has exclusive responsibility in certain areas they find themselves not being sued for some action taken by the NIA in an area given to them by the constitution exclusively the attorney general finds himself being sued <coughs> now that in my view drives a cart and buggy through the constitution and so my position is that rather than the focus that the court had on a question that it created for itself because it was not a question necessary for the case with the Crown Proceedings Act was really the wrong question because what should guide the court what should guide every court is the Constitution and if the constitutional provisions do not sit well with the provision of the Crown Proceedings Act it is the Crown Proceedings Act that must give way not the Constitution because the Crown Proceedings Act is subsidiary it's inferior to the Constitution of the land that is why our Constitution says it is the supreme law and any other law inconsistent with the provision of the Constitution is void to the extent of the inconsistency when I studied law they say that was potanto it is void potanto meaning to the extent of the inconsistency and so I have been scratching my head because I really don't understand the reason for this decision in the first place because it was not a matter necessary for the court to engage in there's a long-held tradition of what is referred to as judicial restraint what does judicial restraint means as I understand it a court does not decide issues that are not before it it is not necessary to determine the matter before it so the court does not get into that none of the lawyers on this case raised this issue the court raised the issue the court invited counsel to advise the court on the issue all the lawyers advise that the NIA has the right and has the capacity and the court said no and so you have now a lot of chatter out there some have attacked the NIA and we understand again this is a heightened political season I don't know what the NIA has done wrong because we were represented throughout there was this miscommunication on the issue of the default judgment but default judgments happen it's a procedural matter and there was an issue of setting aside that now the judgment itself with this decision must necessarily fall away so there's no risk of this 79 million dollar default judgment at this point but that does not really solve the problem because there's a bigger issue of the constitutional standing of the Nevis Island administration and this decision diminishes that it takes away the rights given to that institution by the Constitution it's as if the Constitution says that the NIA has the exclusive responsibility for these areas but the court has said wait a minute the Crown Proceedings Act says that you must go in this particular way and so only the Attorney General can sue and be sued and the only way the Attorney General can sue is for us to ask the Attorney General will you bring a case for us and if you have to ask then the answer could at some point be no we understand the Attorney General for example could be a political appointee and a political figure and operate in a political way what happens if that is the case so this has opened a million can of worms a million cans of worms and so we have moved speedily our legal advisor Madam Helen Lewis has already met with the new Attorney General the Honorable Garth Wilkin 
and I'm told that we are speedily looking, speedily looking at some amendments in the Parliament to the Crown Proceedings Act to fix this matter. I have, however, also given instructions that we look to appeal this decision to the Privy Council, His Majesty's Privy Council. And so we certainly are working to address this immediately to fix this problem that the court, it appears, of its own volition, has decided to create. Let's go to the phones and take some calls. Good evening, you're on the mark. A blessed night again, Brother Premier. Yes, good evening. And give thanks again for your vote. I'd like for you to just emphasize those information to the general public and the, the, to the wider section of the, of the world. Now, I would like to look at something when it comes to education, please. Sure, go ahead. Um, looking at how we see we are just in the pharma of just establishing your uh, school year. I would like to say, hope that the youth them be wise within the levels of the educational procedure and moving forward, the teachers them who are teaching them, uh, who are guiding them along with the parenting levels that we see good initiative steps go forward to each of these youth here. Because even though like you're stating your opening comments, them, you say it's not just about the academics. It can be a part within your creativity too. You see? So I hope that these movements of our youth them take a brighter light looking in the educational format that they are part of right now and hoping that when they leave that level and go to the next, they insist to see what kind of movements that can contribute to the development of navies and the context of how they see the Federation of Thinkers and Navies live together as one. Because it's time now or use them see the moments of how the world is developing and moving rapidly. I don't trust computerized system too much. I use phone. I, I don't even indicate with email, but there are levels of people who have those things. So I like telling that it's time now to see education in the pharma, not just by the European standard, but by an uh, African centric standard that we can see itself being as a progressive people in the developing sense of life and our community and our nation and even the widest part of the world. Because we could build down walls of Babylon in the day of the hour. It's just that we have to unite and unite is the key to our success. Have a blessed night and a good premier. And the matter why I look at when I tell you about the, the stand there by the taxi area with the lamppost kind of to the shed I realize I just said I hope that you could see that neglect the body and see what level they can change the, the movements of that lamp was in that area, please. All right. Okay. If I'm blessed. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have about half an hour left. We're taking your calls. 869-469-1616 and 869-469-1700. So just to indicate to you that the matter of Ocean Reef is being addressed. Um, we, I think, were all taken by surprise by the decision. The decision moved away from uh, 39 years of practice and precedent. And uh, as I said, the learned Chief Justice uh, would have... Uh, decided that this was a matter that she wanted to opine on even though that issue was not before the court and that issue was really not required for the decision that was uh, asked of the court and so it is it is a, a an interesting development let me use a neutral word an interesting development as to how that has happened i've seen some uh, legal luminaries some young legal luminaries including my own daughter brianna brantley has done an article on this case and I'm to commend her and the others who have written because I think it is an important case. But it is no need, in my view, for all the furor and the politicking that some have sought. Some are making politics out of it and they don't even understand what they're talking about. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that and to say that there was no fault or, or wrongdoing or anything of that nature on the part of the Nevis Island government or the people of Nevis. The Honorable Alexis Jeffers would have moved to acquire lands for the benefit of the people of Nevis, and I support him and support that decision 100%, that the lands over there at Herbert's Beach have been secured for generations of Nevisians to come. And so for me, that was an important development. 
some litigation has now resulted because they are alleging of this breach of some developmental agreement that this company purportedly had and that is a matter that ultimately i suppose will be sorted out but the, the issue of this default judgment had to be resolved and the court has sought to resolve it in this way i find it a curious way because this is like taking a a, a, a cannon to kill a mosquito because the cannon is not necessary um, in dealing with the mosquito and it means therefore that all the judges over the years who had consistently said and recognized the right of the NIA to sue and be sued that all of them were wrong and all the lawyers in this case um, Henry Brown, Terry Byron, the Attorney General, the Solicitor General all of them were wrong and so you have this decision that it seems has appeared out of nowhere and uh, it is I believe something for the academics to look at but we who have to deal with the management of this island will have to fix that and the only way it can be fixed is to take the matter to the Privy Council and I've given instructions in that regard and also to look at the legislative changes that could be made and as I said I'm pleased to report that the Honorable Attorney General has already met with the legal advisor to plan the way forward for this particular matter so um, I wanted to make that clear uh, that as a government, I think that people should know me by now and how I operate. I don't respond because people are making noise. I try to get the information, try to come to the public in a reasonable and sensible way with a plan, with accurate information so that the people can know what we are talking about. Do we have anybody holding at the moment? No. So I will continue then to update on a certain uh, on other matters. Um, while I was away. I saw a big furor on social media created um, in large measure by the candidate for St. John's for the NRP, um, Dr. Patricia Bartlett. Um, Dr. Bartlett is from Brownhill and Dr. Bartlett is very familiar with the Ivor Walters Primary School as indeed I am. That's a school I went to. I believe she too must have gone to that school and if she didn't go to that school I know that her siblings and her family would have gone to that school because all the brown people have gone to that school. Let me take this this call and then come back to you. Good evening, you're on the mark. Hello? Hello? Hello, good evening, Mr. Good evening, Mr. Premier. Yes, you're on the mark. Go ahead, please. Yes, so I wanted to raise two issues. One is um, from the ocean reef issue. Is about the ocean reef issue that you just yes. um, raised. And I wanted to ask if you surmise uh, that any of this has any kind of political implication from the recent election? It's a very large question, but um, that's as much as I want to state on that, because I think that some listeners may surmise that. Hmm. Two, the second question is you raised in your soliloquy a point about um, what I see as cultural specificity when you were encouraging the vision to join together and pool resources, it's all logical and financially sensible. But I think I would like to suggest that it probably overlooks the significance of culture in Nevis, I'm speaking to specifically. There's deep mistrust in our culture for each other, even within families. And um, I think that partly beyond the cultural issues, there's a significant missing element of social education. And in that regard, what do I mean by that? I mean that um, oftentimes we don't understand how we can work together to move each other forward, how we can work together to move a family forward, and how we can work together to move the country forward. Those are significant missing factors in our culture. What that requires, therefore, is a particular level of social education throughout the society to move us beyond that kind of selfish individual thinking. It's that problem which is almost like a cancer in the society why you would hear folks say, inside of a family, me don't want she on my land title. Mm -hmm. We don't trust her for him to be part of, and there could be husband and wife in it happening. This is really pervasive throughout the society, and I, I put forward again, it's culturally specific, and there are factors that need to be dealt with prior to this to get us to understand how to move beyond that. 
Those are my two points. Thank you. So before you go, before you go, can I engage you for half a minute? Hello? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, you, 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 you say that this is, uh, I think the language uses is cultural specificity, yeah? Um, in relation to something that is unique perhaps to, to Nivision culture. Some, an observation that we can say is a part of Nivision culture. This notion of... I wouldn't say necessarily unique, sorry. I would not say necessarily unique, but it is pervasive in our tiny society. Okay, so it's pervasive. Do you have any, any thoughts as to why it is so? I mean, it is not genetic. Oh. It, is, it is a consequence. It has to be a consequence of shared experience. But, but why is it so? Because we see other cultures, we see even in our own small community, persons of different cultures come in here. And I use the example of going to a, a business place and seeing somebody from a different culture working there. And you go back a year later and 10 people are working there. None of them are in a vision. And you ask, why did this happen? Because every time a vacancy arises here, they tell the cousin. They bring their friend, they bring their family, they bring their neighbor. Because yeah, as, this, as this example of the, the African gentleman talking about Australia showed, he's saying, listen, the, the pe people from different cultures are not just pooling money. They're pooling opportunity. They're sharing information in their communities of opportunities that are available. Whereas in our culture, it appears, I put it no higher than that, it appears that what we do is we say we get in the door so we try to keep out other people. Yeah, and that point, that's the point that I was um, alluding to, and that's a point well taken. And you're asking, why is it that way in our culture? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that there's a need for a particular kind of social education to move us beyond this. The why, the, the details of the why, I would take a long time for me to explain. But to give you a quick answer to your question, I think it's because we... Suffer. I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but we, it's experiential knowledge. And that experiential knowledge tells us that everything and everyone will work against us. Without us recognizing, that means we're working against each other. Mm. When we look at other cultures, at the Indians or the, the others that you mentioned who would come in and help each other, they don't see each other as individuals. They see each other as community. What we are lacking here, to a large extent, is community. We find it easier to sit together and complain and criticize. And, and sometimes we're criticizing the, the one division who's moving forward because that person is a hard worker, has done all the necessary steps and, you know, moved themselves forward. And we start hating them. We start running them down. Mm -hmm. And we... And that leads us to practice xenophobia. Xenophobia, hatred of other cultures because they're moving forward or be, whatever the because factors are. But they, we start practicing xenophobia and we start saying, you know, the Indians come in and they do this and this and the Jamaicans come and the Guyanese come and these Spanish people, meaning the Dominicans. We have something to say negative about everyone else and ourselves. It's really important to remember it includes us about ourselves. Hmm. It is a very negative kind of thinking that holds us back as a society. It holds us back. We will not give somebody a vision who comes back with, you know, some young person who returned with, you know, the qualifications we sent them away to get that the government or the scholarship that they got or whatever sent them to get. They come back here and they are in the same job before they left, if they have a job at all, or when they get one, it has nothing to do with the engineering degree that they got. Or That is a feature of this syndrome that I'm talking about. What it means is that somebody who's in charge of, and I'm speaking now to issues that have been brought to me personally by some of these young people, it means that they come back and they have the qualifications or whatever, but the person who's in charge of the job that they applied for don't like their family or think that the little girl, you know, she thinks she's a big shot now because she has a degree and don't put her in a place. We're not going to hire her. Mm -hmm. That's holding the child back because she has been, she has returned because she has 
she owes the government something, so they're bonded for a while, and she will go through the bond period, suffering that two years or whatever, in that job that is not utilizing the skills that the state paid for her to get, and as soon as the bond is over, she leaves. So we are, educa we are educating people for exploitation. We don't use their skills here, because some malicious-minded person who is on a power trip is exercising their power to hurt, without recognizing it sometimes, hurt the country. That's the point I'm making. We do not think about each other. We think about the self. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, um, that caller. Thanks for staying on the line with me. I certainly appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. It, it's interesting, this caller's observations. Um, and uh, I, I know who the caller is. I recognize the voice, and so I know that she comes to it with a considerable level of intellectual capacity and study. Um, but it's interesting, caller, because I have often talked about my background. I, I'm not afraid to say where I'm from um, and my circumstances. I, I came out of the, the depths of poverty, and I am where I am today because people helped me. And I have not been, been shy to say that. Some people like to pretend, but I'm not one of those people. And I was able to get scholarships throughout my life. I was the first Social Security scholarship recipient. I've always thanked them and, and said what a difference they made in my life. I was able to get um, a scholarship to study law, and I was able to get a scholarship to go to Oxford University. Um, I have lived long enough to hear my political opponents in Nevis, the NRP, refer to me as a wealthier child. And in their effort to denigrate and attack me, they have not looked to say, well, okay, here's a little boy who come from Henley Park, Scarborough, who has walked barefoot and gone to chapel school and suffered and struggled and walked two miles when he moved to Brownville to go to Charleston school in the rain and no got no car and eat bread and, and cheese for lunch because that's what man embraced him because that's what mother could afford and that kind of thing. No, no, no. Oh, you're a wealthy baby because you, you get scholarship to study. When you look at the reality that even those making the accusation and using it to attack me, they or their families had equally benefited from scholarships to study as most of us have had. So, you look at that and I think that there is a, a, a kernel of truth, irrefutable truth in what you're saying because we are quick to drag down our own. Somebody sent me something on Facebook today and they said that on any measure thus far in our 39 years of independence that my contribution in the sphere of our diplomacy has been head and shoulders above anybody else's in terms of foreign minister. In terms of what I've done, the, the milestones, the achievements, taking our passport to number one in the Caribbean, etc., etc. But there are those who would never in this lifetime recognize that or say, yes, you did an excellent job as foreign minister. Even if I have differences with you over here, I can acknowledge you did a good job here because it's all or nothing and if people are opposed to you and it doesn't need to be politics some people say oh this is politics no a lot of what passes as politics in Nevis is personal let me tell you all. I saw a comment made by somebody the other day who said that if the NRP were to run a, run a big stone against Mark Brantley they will vote for the stone because they don't support NRP they are against Mark Brantley that is not politics that is personal the people talk about your socks, your hair, your clothes, what you wear, your watch, how much it costs, what you drive, take picture of your house. Those things are not politics. Those things are personal. Because those things have absolutely nothing to do with the lives of the community that you are, as a politician, supposedly interested in enriching. And I think, Carla, that your 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 what you've said here to me deserves replaying. People need to listen to it and reflect on it. Because you're right, a lot of our people, their sole purpose, it seems, is to fight down our own people rather than lift us up. Acknowledge, listen, Tom was a great cricketer, but Tom's time as a great cricketer has passed. Here comes little Jim, 
and Jim is also a great cricketer, has the potential. Will Tom invest in Jim? Or will Tom say, no, because Jim going to surpass me? And it's a problem. Some people who have been in leadership position in different organizations, they don't want no leader to come through and eclipse them. And so they leave the position, but while they've left the position, they're in the back fighting against who now have the position. Because they don't want that new person to eclipse them. It happens. And it's part of this culture. The caller is far more qualified than me to speak to that, but she suggests that it is, it is a cultural thing. I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that it is not as pervasive as we are saying it is. And that persons out there listening can really say, boy, why is it we do that? You know, I have somebody holding. I'll take the call in one, one second. Let me just make this last point. As a lawyer, a young man came to me once and he said that he was talking to another youngster who had a serious legal problem. And he said, boy, Mark Brandt is the best lawyer in Nevis. I said, you should go to him. And the guy said, me, me now go to he. He done make, he doing well. Me now go spend my money with he. And so the youngster opted to go to somebody else who messed up his case. And then he come back and he said, Boy, why should we say, well, go to Mark Brantley now? And I smile. Because there are some people who refuse to give you their business because they say you're doing too well. Our own people. They're not going to give you their money. But they go by the Chinese store every day and they buy. And they don't think that the Chinese is doing well. If you build a little house, Oh, watch a big horse, he build a mansion. They go around and take picture of your house. Share it on social media. They take video. My father left me a piece of land over here in, um, um, what do they call over there? Shaw's Road area there. And I was asked by the neighbors to clear the land. I clear the land. I see some boy take some video. Say how much land I have. Where I get all that land from and land and this. Now, how is that? relevant to anything other than the crab in a barrel mentality that we have encouraged here in some quarters for far too long let me go to the phone because somebody has been holding for a while we have 10 minutes good evening caller good night good night good night to you brother how are you doing? i'm good man how are things i'm okay mm -hmm. well i want to join and tell you that yes you have done a good job in terms of the foreign um the means of foreign affairs I think you have done a good job, yes. But we may grant the issue that you're on there right now, right? I've been thinking myself too, because the lady is correct that we... I don't know if, if it's more pronounced in Nevis than anywhere else, but I notice we definitely have this problem in Nevis. And you ask the question, why? And I really can answer that question either why whether it, it started some time way back but what i could say though i could suggest you listening right yes man yeah what i could suggest is that perhaps perhaps in this school in this school we you we may need to inject something into the curriculum where you start teaching the young children the importance of togetherness and partnership and also the the benefits because there's a lot of benefit to it there's a lot a lot of benefit to it and also the importance of supporting and your own supporting your own not that you don't support others too but to support your own too i think you know we may have to start teaching the young children from now on something along that line you hear what I'm saying? yes yes I hear you I hear you because it is a prevailing problem and I notice and even even people come here and talk to me and said they never see so many abandoned buildings and land just sitting down because um, parents die and children siblings don't want to come together mm -hmm and cooperate <coughs> and do something about it either share it up or come together and sell it and share it up they prefer to just leave it there 
Where it benefits nobody. Just leave it there. Everybody saying, if I don't get all of it, nobody get none. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it just seemed to me <laughs> like maybe it's because I live in Nevis, but sometimes I feel like it's real bad in Nevis. I don't know why. Hmm. And so I am saying some sort of mindset has to change. Okay. Our mindset brother. has to change. Yes. And I don't know, but I, I feel that some thoughts should be given to, um, as I say, put in something. We are in school. These things are taught. The importance of partnership, because I live in New York all about all the big business. Sometimes it's, it's a thousand people that come together and form, form a, a corporation. Of course. You know, and you know, how many people here in Nevis, I could say even in my own family too, you know, individually, we're not able to do a certain thing, but if, if three or four of us was to come there together, we could do other things. Mm -hmm. And I, and I am talking about myself too, it just seems like this is a, a, a problem that we just don't do it. So, you guys might want to think about what I say. All right, brother. Yeah, okay, then you have a good night. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so let me just go back very quickly. I think these callers are making some very salient points. I just wanted to make one last point. I was speaking about a uh, furor that was manufactured about the Ivor Walters Primary School by Dr. Patricia Bartlett. And uh, it was unfortunate because Dr. Bartlett lives in Brownhill. Um, she's from Brownhill. And I know that she could have walked into the school at any point and spoken to the head teacher. A uh, cop picked up the phone and uh, asked a question. She drives by there like I do every single day. Um, and to take the social media to make a suggestion that the children over there did not have chairs and desks and therefore was sitting on the floor, I thought was beneath her. Now, for whatever reason, the NRP seems to have a fixation on Ivor Walters Primary School. We had a former um, candidate this gentleman uh, daily kelvin daily who put up a huge thing on social media about the kitchen being infested with cockroaches and having to be shut down at Ivor walters it was a lie no such thing i was so alarmed when i saw it that i called over there quickly to ask what was going on to the bafflement and bewilderment of the principal and staff are saying they have no idea what this is about the kitchen is functioning normally there's no such thing then there was an allegation about an infestation of termites and, and, and um, bats. I think it was bats, I'm sorry. And bat droppings all over the school. Again, lies. Just manufactured stories. But I expect anything from Mr. Daly. Mr. Daly and the truth have never known, uh, known each other's company. They're not friends. But I expected that Dr. Bartlett would know better. And would before she gets into that vein, which seems to be an NRP DNA thing. She's not from the NRP, she's CCM. She has belatedly decided that she wants to try a thing by putting on some green clothes. That is okay. But I would have thought that the principles that she would have learned from a principled party like the CCM would have guided her. Now on this exercise in which she's embarked with the NRP. And at least find out what is happening. Now, when I heard all the hullabaloo, I said, well, what is this? I spoke to the minister, the Honorable Troy Leibold. I spoke to the PEOs and Ella Claxton. I spoke to the head teacher. To me, that is what you do when you're responsible. You speak to the people who could tell you what the position is to find out that this was entirely not the case. And I just don't understand why it is we keep seeking to sensationalize and seek to say things that are not true. Not to say that we are offering a solution because no solution was offered, you know. Like, oh, imagine the children them over Ivor Walters got to sit on any floor because they've not got no desk and chair. Mark Brantley is a failure. That is the objective. When it is not true. And what does it do? But it seeks to shine a negative spotlight on the school that we all hold dear. It is my alma mater. As I said, I'm sure she went there. She didn't go there. Her relatives went for sure. It is the alma mater for so many of us in Brownhill, Prospect, Church Ground, Cane Garden, Victoria Road. So you ask the question, well, why? It's an institution there. 
And yes, the schools sometimes have difficulties and problems. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that everything is white fine. But let us see how we can offer to help rather than the constant effort to denigrate and attack. That to me is what is important. And so I wanted to end on that point because perhaps it fits into the whole narrative tonight of us as a community and as a country doing better. That ultimately has to be our goal that we seek to do better. And when I'm here as a politician, I'm here as a radio show host, I'm a lawyer, I'm a father, I'm a member of the community. Let us all strive to do better, to support each other and to seek when we must criticize that we have the facts and we have the information and we come not just to say look the children have not got no way to sit down but we come with a solution or proposal as to how we can solve the problem and for god's sake for god's sake i'm begging our people before you mouth off find out the truth make a few calls visit get the information so that you can be accurate no bother say no rochi no german cockroachy there at Ivor walters when no roach over there Nobody say no bat over there when none over there. Nobody say no picnic sit down on no floor because of lack of cheer and yes when that is not the case. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my show. The banner struck up, it means I have to go. This show is rebroadcast tomorrow at 1 p.m. right here on Bond Radio. Thank you. Good night. And on the preceding program were solely those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Neighbors Broadcasting Company Limited or